Welcome to a new meeting with Amir Sarfati. We talked today about Israel and, uh, and today about the political situation uh, from biblical perspective, but looking and talking about Israel. First of all, how you, you have a few phrases to see what is the momentum now related to Israel and the Middle East? Well, you know, Israel is, is, is having two different vectors that are uh, operating in and out. Inside, we have a, a, a great, uh, I guess, crisis, political crisis, um, that is fueled by outside sources. We have the left, liberal, progressive left, that is fueled with millions of dollars from outside to uh, basically topple this uh, conservative government. Yeah, so, I mean, this is unbelievable. Hundreds of millions flowed in the last uh, few months in order to destabilize the country and cause the fall of this government. Uh, so, you know, it's very alarming uh, to see that uh, actually they, uh, they haven't toppled the government, but they did disrupt the very long-awaited judicial reform, unfortunately. Uh, we'll have to wait for that one, I guess, in the future. But uh, on the, the other vectors are everything on the outside. On the outside, we're seeing two or three major, um, <clears throat> major trends. The first trend is the weakening of the United States in the Middle East. America is very weak. America is perceived as the one that is afraid to take action against the villain, and, but, and it's actually being extorted by the villain, which is Iran in this case. And when Saudi Arabia and others see that uh, they cannot trust America anymore, they run to the next superpower, which is China, and said, okay, if, if we cannot get any guarantees from America, at least let's China broker a deal between us and the Iranians so we can reduce the tension and the potential um, <clears throat> danger for us. So we see the rise of China and the decline of America on one hand. We also see Russia. Russia and Iran are collaborating in levels that we have not seen before due to the Ukraine war. Uh, Iranians uh, and Russians are the two most sanctioned nations on planet Earth right now, and they became very good friends. Uh, they share values of sanctions and how to you know, get away with it. Russia is getting away with sanctions by selling oil to India, and India is using Russian oil um, and selling it to the rest of the world as an Indian uh, oil. The same goes with Saudi Arabia. The Saudis are buying cheap Russian oil for their own consumption, and they're using the Saudi oil to be exported in three times the money. So the Russians found their way to make others rich and to get away with the uh, sanctions. The Iranians have the same tricks also. And now we have a not only political but military alliance between the two countries. So the Iranians, believe it or not, are exporting weapons due and thanks to Joe Biden. Because when Joe Biden became president in America, one of the first things he did, he lifted sanctions related to the export and import of weapons in Iran. And that is why they can export legally weapons to Russia, and eventually the same weapon that the Europeans were so excited to allow Iran to export is now being used against Europe. So what happened is, they, as long as Iran is aiming at Israel, Europe has no problem, America has no problem, but now it backfires. And now it is actually both drones and missiles that Iran makes are used on European soil. So we see the alliance of Russia with Iran and Turkey is also sitting on the fence. You see the decline of America and the rise of China, and you see the uh, Iranian proxies all around Israel lifting up their head and thinking probably that's the right time to threaten the destruction and the annihilation of the state of Israel. So you summarize the situation in, inside or outside. Exactly. Of, uh, related to Israel, in fact, in the Middle East and the end time, because everything is, would have the... Absolutely. Uh, in the end times, we know that uh, America will not stand by Israel because the Ezekiel says that no one is going to help Israel when the Gog and Magog war is coming. So we know that America cannot physically help us. Second, uh, we, we hear in, in, in Ezekiel uh, report that uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and later on Syria, Sudan and Libya are going to take part in this war. Uh, so we're not surprised with that one. 
Uh, and also Israel is finding more gas and more oil is becoming richer and richer and more desired by the Russians. So the growth of Israel's energy power, the, the, power, the problem that Russia has, and the alliances that it is uh, you know, putting together, as well as the decline of America, all of that has been foretold. This is all part of what we already spoke of for many years. Look, I did not see the Ukraine war five years ago, but I did see the alliance of Iran and Russia. I, t I, I preached about it for the last 25 years, almost 30 years. And why? Am I a prophet? No. But I read the prophets. Am I a genius? No. I just search and read the Word of God. Uh, and so, in a way, Christians need to understand knowing the Word of God and believing in the Word of God and studying the Word of God makes you way more intelligent and smarter than the most if important intelligence communities in, in, in the world. Short question. You mentioned already about this. What means Israel will remain alone? Remain alone means no country will help Israel. That's what it means, it remains alone. And I may even say that even the Israeli government and military will not be the factor that will bring about a victory. It will be God. If you read carefully the account of Ezekiel 38, you can clearly see that God supernaturally intervened on behalf of Israel to bring about a victory. It's not the Israeli military, it's not the Israeli government, the Israeli generals, the Israeli technology, it's God. In what way? Not in way of Israeli technology, but in way of God's supernatural interference. And we're talking about earthquake, we're talking about uh, uh, amazing things that are going to fall from the sky that will hit our enemies and destroy them. God is the God of Israel, he, he who keeps Israel that neither slumbers nor sleep. He is the one that stands there and he keeps the apple of his eye. And I always advise to any nation that wants to annihilate Israel, develop new weapons that will destroy the sun, the moon, and the stars. Don't develop weapons that destroy Israel. Israel, the Bible says, will remain as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars are there. Only, as in Jeremiah 31, only when the sun, the moon, and the stars will not be there, then Israel will no longer be a nation before God. So the best way for any nation to win a war or to, to destroy Israel or to wipe them out from the map is not to fight Israel, is to destroy those elements. That's a good perspective. Yes. Another question, you mentioned already about the national resources, gas, oil that uh, Israel discover. It's important, it's only economical uh, perspective or also religious and end time perspective. Look, uh, Iran is not running after Israel because of oil or gas, but Russia does. And Russia is the initiator and is the one that is being the spearhead uh, of the whole uh, invasion. So we know that Gog from the land of Magog will come, and with him, you know, it's going to be Persia and Gomer and the house of the Gomer. They will join him. But if it, but the, the, so the main, you know, spearhead of this whole invasion is Russia, and it is because of something that they want to have from that we have. Okay, which in this case, of course, it's very obvious that it's uh, gas and oil. I don't think that Turkey wants our gas and oil. I don't think that Iran wants our gas and oil. They, as a radical Muslim, uh, you know, leaders, they want us to be de destroyed. You know, they, they don't want uh, uh, our presence there. But the main reason why Russia will even go, and that will embolden Iran and Turkey to join, is the gas and the oil. So definitely, definitely, energy is the major thing. And the Bible, by the way, say, that every one of those countries that will criticize this war will say, have you come to take plunder, to take booty? I mean, it is obviously a financial gain here. It's obviously an economical war here. It's not the political or religious. Everyone else will hop on it for religious or political reasons. But the main reason that will draw Russia into this whole thing I don't think it's religious. I mean, the Russians... They don't, don't care about second government no, of rights. No, they don't. They don't, they don't care about uh, Islam also. They don't, they're, they're not there to fulfill uh, uh, the, the wishes of the Muslims. They're here to, to take what they think should be theirs. Look, Russia is making very clear, even throughout the Ukrainian war, what we believe should be ours, we are going to invade and take. <laughs> Russian invasion is no longer an enigma. It's a reality already, even in Europe. You don't, have to you don't have to wonder. And if they think that they need something that should belong to them, they will just go and take it. 
people Can try. add some significance of this conflict? Uh, it's, uh, it says important in end time scenario. The conflict in Ukraine, you mean? The, yes. It's very significant. Look, first of all, we have to understand wars uh, between nations are not mentioned in the Bible. The wars normally that are mentioned in the Bible are related to Israel. Okay, so Bible prophecy is not about nations and their relations between themselves. It's about nations and their relation with Israel. So having said that, okay, what is the relation to Israel right now? Very, very triple, I will say. A, first of all, it is because of this war that the Jews from Ukraine and Russia are now fleeing all the way to Israel. First thing, God is bringing his people back. Second, you can see the importance of the Israeli gas and oil is going up rapidly, which makes the case for why Ezekiel war will start. And third, you can clearly see the Ezekiel, uh, what I call alliance being formed. You know, if it wasn't for the war there, Russia wouldn't be sanctioned and Iran wouldn't be sending Russia drones. So the, the, the alliance is being there. The, the importance of taking the Israeli gas so it won't be a competition anymore is there. And of course, the return of the Jews. So there's several things that this war is producing that are biblical. But again, the conflict between the Russians and the Ukrainians as, as a conflict between two countries is not exactly what the Bible is talking about. Will you explain here why Iran is so against Israel and they want to wipe up from the map? It's a root there, it's a religious, it's a Muslim. Obviously, with... I mean, obviously this is satanic and diabolic, but it is part of their, you know, their belief that we are, you know, there's big Satan and small Satan. We are the enemies of Shia Islam. We are, we are the thing that they hate the most. <clears throat> you have to understand something. Unlike what most people think, Jerusalem is not a holy site for Iran. I don't know if you know that, but Najaf in Iraq or uh, is the third holiest site for Shiites, not Jerusalem. It's not that the Shiites in, in, in Iran are fighting for Jerusalem because of religious perspective. It's, it's, all, you know, it's, it's all political and it's the destruction of Israel for, you know, for their sake. But, but we have to remember ever since Khomeini took over in February of 1979, um, he vowed to destroy Israel. Israel was a, one of the best friends of Iran up until 1979. Not only that El Al used to fly to Tehran on a weekly basis, but even the Mossad had a station in Tehran. I don't know if you know that, but the embassy in Tehran was the most important embassy Israel had in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, we, very few countries uh, had such an importance to Israel, such as Iran. Iran was, uh, you know, was uh, a big ally, and Khomeini thought that uh, Part of destroying the Shah and all of his opponent, and all of his collaborators is also we need to uproot this whole Jewish influence that we have, God forbid, uh, from coming from Israel, and that's it. Look, uh, they it's a diabolic thing. It's a because let's face it. Why should Iran want to destroy Israel? We don't even share a border. Nothing. Iran is far away. Israel is more than a thousand kilometers away from Iran. Why would one country, a thousand, three hundred, thousand, five hundred kilometers away from me, should you know want to destroy me? What did I do? It's a them? question that we have here in Romania. Yeah, but the, you, that's when you see that it's 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 spiritual. That it's it's a diabolic. It's satanic, and uh, they are definitely invest a lot of money and time and effort into implementing their plan. It's an, like a national calling for them. Yes. Uh, we have, a, uh, we mentioned a few min minutes ago the uh, word embassy, Tehran. Mm -hmm. What it's important for a nation to have embassy in Jerusalem, spiritually or economically or politically. Why? Well, I, look, when you move your embassy to Jerusalem, you're basically acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish people. When you don't have your embassy in Jerusalem, you're not acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish people. You're acknowledging that you have a relationship with Israel, but you don't believe that Jerusalem is their capital. It's very simple. Jerusalem is not only the capital, but it's been there for 3,000 years, the capital of Israel. Jerusalem is not even mentioned one time in the Quran. The Muslims never had any independent state called Palestine in the history. All of the lies and the deceptions that we keep hearing is based on pure, sheer ignorance of people. They don't understand that. 
Um, uh, I would say that um, if you know carefully how Jerusalem became even important to Muslims, you would be embarrassed. It was, you know, it was a fight between a Muslim leader in Damascus and a Muslim leader in Mecca. And the, Me the Mecca guy says, you're not coming to Mecca for Hajj. The guy in Damascus says, where am I going to Hajj? Let's turn Jerusalem into a holy site and therefore make a hajj over there. That's it. It's so embarrassing that so many people don't even know this piece of history. But Jerusalem, how can it be so important to a religion that doesn't even mention it once in its holy scriptures? I mean, you can see that. So I think that a country that acknowledges Israel as a nation and acknowledges Jerusalem as its capital is a country that you know, is standing on the biblical uh, values. Well, is Romania, if, if that's it's where question, you are going, heart, yes. uh, I, I believe Romania will, will, will be tremendously blessed if they do that. But I also think that uh, Romania will not do that because the EU is much more uh, appealing to them than, 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 you know, having to stand for some biblical principle, you know? It's not like there is a born-again, spirit-filled government in Romania that wants to fulfill the word of God and the plans of God and the will of God. That would be something else, you know? That could, Donald, could happen, we are praying for this. Let's face it, Donald Trump was very much influenced by evangelical Christians to make that move. It wasn't the move that, you know, it was all political. It was definitely based on you know, spiritual, uh, you know... Um, Prayer and lobby and... Absolutely, uh, absolutely. It wasn't uh, an easy thing for him to do, but he truly believed that uh, this is the right thing to do. Okay, now, did it help him? I mean, is he the president? What, did he win the elections, the, you know, two years later? He did not. Uh, is America on the right track to be a, a godly nation? It's not. Uh, it's so, moving the embassy is a good and the right thing to do. But unless the nation is godly and repent, it's not going to, it's not a magic trick. It's not like you want to be blessed, just move the embassy. No, you want to be blessed, follow God. It's the embassy is not, it's not like uh, taking the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield and hoping to win. You know, it's, it's and so... And get the blessing. Yes. This became my second question. What means to be blessed or to be cursed? It's related maybe with this, uh, uh, maybe it's an Old Testament style uh, formula. What means no, well, for a nation? Well, first of all, in, you know, in, in Genesis 12, God said, I will bless those who bless you and curse the one who curses you. To be blessed is to flourish and to see the, the, the goodness of God and to see you know, the goodness of God upon you and upon your children. That's to be blessed. Uh, to be cursed is to not see the blessing of God and uh, be eventually vanished from the, plan, from the map, from the plan. So um, I... I I truly believe that, uh, um, you know, uh, all the enemies of Israel uh, are gone from the history, you know. And, and I know that even if Russia will come against us and Iran will come against us, they'll be gone. I mean, there's no doubt. And uh, people ask me if, 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 if Egypt is going to uh, wipe Israel out. Is Israel, I, I, I don't see that. I actually see that Israel, Egypt will survive as a nation because I see that Zechariah says that uh, at the end of the millennial kingdom, actually throughout the millennial kingdom, Egypt is a nation that if they want God's blessing, they have to uh, uh, come to Jerusalem once a year. If they don't want God's blessing, they should not. So Israel, Egypt is mentioned there, okay? Uh, so, you know, I'm only basing everything I say on scriptures, you know? And to be blessed, or to be cursed, uh, a lot of it has to do with to honor God's and God's people also. Now, are the people of Israel saints? No. Are they, uh, you know, uh, better? No. But God is testing the nations with Israel. If you hate them, then you hate me. If you love them, then you love me. It's, it's a supernatural love for Israel. It's not something you can explain. And if you, you cannot hate that which God loves and love that which God hates. This is something, and Israel is a litmus test to the nations and to the church, by the way. And to every Christian. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. that's what I said, to the church. <laughs> yeah. uh, a few comments about China. It's in the Bible. How you yeah. see China? Because well, it's the, Obviously, the name China is not in the Bible, but when we look at the verses related to the kings of the East, we can, you know, we can conclude that maybe China is part of it. 
but again, as I said to you before, you know, well, uh, anything, affairs of nations between each other are not something that God will have in his word. But when it comes to Israel, that's when it will be mentioned in the Bible. I think China's role right now is to bring down America uh, and to replace America as a superpower. But at the same time, uh, you know, I, I don't see that as uh, uh, something that, um, you know, only when, when China will make a move towards Israel, um, then I, I, I would start looking for its relevance in scriptures. Uh, in fact, China has a very strong relationship with Israel. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we understand the shift that is happening. We understand that America is declining. We understand that China is rising. Uh, but again, China has many problems. China has many problems with its economy, with, uh, with food shortage. Some even suggest that there'll be a great famine there in the near future. Uh, China is, is having a housing a bubble also that bursted. And, and, and so there's, you know, but, but to be honest, America owns so much money to China that uh, both are, are, you know, fighting right now uh, to, uh, to see who is going to have the highest GDP and who is going to become the world's superpower. It looks to me that um, Israel is not going to be affected by all of this. What we are going to be affected by is mostly the, the, the regional um, thing, uh, which is the alliance that will come against us and the, you know, and the outcome of that war. Well, you talk about China a little bit, which I talk about the United States, but we are here in Europe. Uh, of course, we, are, we see the rise of the anti-Semitic spirit. We, the Europe as a uh, political entity is not pro-Israel. How you see, and people said, oh, from Europe will come the Antichrist because it's a, uh, some, uh, what do you see the Europe and Romania, of course, part of yeah. you uh, related to Israel? Well, I, I do believe that the Antichrist will come from Western Europe because I believe he will be coming from the revived Roman Empire. I do believe that. But I also see that uh, the anti-Semitism in Europe is receiving new faces. A lot of the Muslims that fled the Middle East moved to Europe, but now they're a leading force in anti-Semitism in Europe. So besides the regular anti-Semites, uh, many of them have, by the way, Christian identity, now you have the radical Muslims that moved to Europe and are, are also a very big force in anti-Semitism. Uh, I do believe that God has just like uh, God said to Peter, to, uh, to Paul in Corinth, I have still many people in this city. Paul wanted to leave. He saw a lot of resistance. He said, I'm not staying. And God revealed himself to Paul in the middle of the night, says, stay here because I, I have many people in this city. I, I do believe that with all the sheer evil uh, and progressive liberal mindset of Western Europe, still God has many people in this place. And I, I believe with all of my heart that uh, more than any time before, Europe is now not the sender of, of uh, missionaries to the rest of the world, but is the receiver of missionaries. It's a mission field, people, Absolutely. some said. Even some yes. African friends said, yes, Europe yes, is yes. a mission field for us. Absolutely. We Absolutely. are not so pleased with this, but this is a truth. It is the truth. Uh, and, and uh, I hope Romania will be a place, one of the places I to re, so. re, I hope restore so. the Christian values. A few questions at the end about Israel. So. Um, your perspective of messianic movement, not only in Israel, but all over. People criticize, is there, what is messianic movement? They're, they're not a church, they're not a Jewish people. What are the messianic movement? Messianic Jews are still searching for their identity because uh, they're being rejected by the church and they're being rejected by the synagogue, I always say. So they're searching for identity. Some of them wants to, f to, to find grace in the eyes of the Jews, so they are becoming a bit more on the orthodox side. Some of them wants to be uh, accepted more by the established church, so they are getting more and more and more, uh, you know, gentilized, I would say. But at the end of the day, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a group of people that is, uh, you know, fairly new. Uh, I mean, Messianic Jewish movement is not that old. I mean, they, the, the first church was Messianic Jews, but, you know, almost 2,000 years later, it's only about 200 years old that Jewish believers resurrected and floated and r rose uh, to the surface after hiding for so many, many years. Uh, we're still looking for our way. 
Um, I belong to a congregation uh, in Haifa. We have Jews and Arabs and non-Jews. And some congregations are a bit more like a synagogue. Some are a bit more like a, an American church, whatever. Look, what's more important is the message. And do we really share the gospel and get people saved? That's the most important thing. And if a uh, Messianic Jewish congregation that is a bit more Jewish style is appealing to some Jewish people and cause them to get saved, then so be it. And if people want to run away from religion and find in other Messianic congregations you know, a house, so be it. Look, like Paul said, I am everything to everyone as long as I preach the word. And um, we, we, you know, everyone needs to choose where he wants to fellowship. And, but again, we're very diverse. And, but I hope that at least we, hold, we all hold the same values. Unfortunately, the one thing that is creeping into Messianic Judaism in America and Europe and in Israel is that there is a, there's two, two things. One, there is the new apostolic reformation, which uh, somehow put in the mind of some Messianic Jews that they are another new wave of apostles and and that uh, their job is to prepare earth to the return of Jesus, which is completely unbiblical. Uh, the, the, first, uh, the first century apostles wrote the word of God and, and on their foundation, the church was built. The church was built on the, on the foundation of Christ and the apostles and the prophets. And Christ is the chief cornerstone, of course, but that's it. it, it the church is on top. So there's no new wave of apostles that now have the same exact authority. And we're not going to prepare this earth for Christ. Christ will take us from this earth because he's going to judge this earth. But the other problem that I see that's creeping in, and for quite a few years, is the um, movement uh, to deny the deity of Christ. Uh, and uh, it's very sad because uh, uh, you know, that's the stumbling block of the Jewish people with Jesus, that he's God. And if, 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 if you remove that, they think uh, now they will accept us. They'll never accept you. <laughs> They'll never accept you and don't ever compromise on it. Because if you compromise on the deity of Christ, you basically completely threw the whole gospel to the garbage. Or at least two-thirds of the New Testament. Okay, uh, not exactly the final question, but I have about Aliyah. Is Aliyah increasing and is a sign yes. of the end time? Absolutely. Well, I have a perspective on this. Yeah. Aliyah means return of yes. the Jewish people on their land. Correct. So Israeli... this happened for many years. Correct. But then the numbers started sliding down. And in the last couple of years, a lot of it due to COVID and to uh, the war in Ukraine, it's increasing to new heights. Definitely, it's related. God said that at the end he is going to bring all, all of his people from the four corners of the world. And he's still doing that. So it's definitely increasing and is a sign of the end. We here in Romania, Zala Fomago, we help to transportation some Jewish people to come from Ukraine to the airports. But what, uh, as a Christian, what to do? To stay and to admire and to, to take notes of all this? Well, what is I, I a think, challenge for Romanian viewers? First of all, you, you do what the Lord is telling you to do. I mean, you need to listen to God. God, some people, he calls them to help physically, some to help financially, some to help spiritually by praying. I mean, all the one thing for sure, all of us want to see the Jewish people return to their land. That's for sure. Yes. And I, I still don't understand why any Jew would still want to remain in Russia and Ukraine. I don't get it. But I guess a war is something that finally gets them to, to, to do, make that move. Okay. Some people, some Christians are concerned about the instability in Israel. You already mentioned at the beginning about this as a, as a yeah. point. Uh, some people said, oh, this is the end of the, the state of Israel. Uh, they, this will be the, for their destructions. What you see? What, what means from uh, this inst uh, in severe yeah. instability? The instability, first of all, you have to understand, most of it is echoed by a media that is completely on one side. The media, I call them the Medianites. Uh, and, and our media is not any, uh, you know, balanced media. They are completely bought into one camp to smear the other camp. So the instability in Israel, the political instability in Israel, uh, you know, is going on for quite a few years now, ever since COVID, because 
you know, there is elements that wants to see Netanyahu uh, stepping down and uh, the left taking over. They tried for a year and a half, but through deception. Deception. They took one party that is right-wing, conservative, bribed its leader, will give you the seat of the prime minister. Never in the history it ever happened. In the, you know, for, that someone to, to stand and say in front of everyone, if you vote for me, I will not sit with Lapid. I will not sit with the Muslim Brotherhood. I will not do this. And the next day after the elections, he ran to do all the things he said he's not. Why? Because they promised him the seat of the prime minister. He's, it's a crook. It's a criminal. And he, that deception cost him because no one wants to see him or hear about him now. He's, he's being held as a pariah. Now, I would tell you that um, everyone could see that this, this attempt to replace government uh, failed. Netanyahu received overwhelming uh, majority of 64 seats. And ever since, they've tried to undermine him again and again and again, no matter what he will do. Yes, judicial reform, no judicial reform, no matter what he will do, their aim is to topple him and their aim is to remove any sense of Jewish national uh, conservative uh, aspect in Israel. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movement. It's a movement to secularize the, the world. And it's a progressive movement that, you know, is, is everything is okay, no borders, no limits, fluid, you're fluid in everything. Every time Israel wanted to be accepted to be what, like the rest of the world, Israel was, uh, you know, eventually not just punished, but, but suffered greatly because of this. We're not like the rest. We cannot be like the rest. We're not called to be like the rest. We are not meant to be like the rest. We were not created to be like the rest. God has a certain plan, and, a, and, and, and that's it. Israel, I mean, remember Balaam, when he looked at Israel, he said, I see a nation set apart, not reckoning itself from all the others. My question um, could be there. And a few weeks ago was a celebration of 70 five years of the modern state of Israel is significant? It's something for this year, could be eight years, could be seven years. Why I mean 70 in the economy of uh, Israel and uh, with the end time perspective? First of all, our enemies thought we will be gone a long time ago and we're still here. 75 is a nice number, but I, I do think that the closer we get to anything between 80 and 100, we were very excited because uh, the Bible says that this generation that will see the fig tree blooming we shall not pass away. So for, for the rapture's perspective of the rapture of the church, uh, the length of the state of Israel is the length of that, you know, it's, it's, it's what we look at as when to expect the rapture to happen, basically. So it's very significant. For the Jewish people, whether it's 70 or 80, it doesn't matter. They, they don't see themselves not there, but for us, uh, you know, we are the generation that shall not pass away. It's exciting. Uh, we almost done with my list with questions, but I have, you mentioned already the fig tree, I have the olive tree and the, the wine. Correct. Uh, you can explain for our yes. viewers what these three represent. Yes, represent the, the, of vine, Israel. Yeah, the vine and the, and, and the olive are Israel spiritual and religious privileges. And now Gentiles that come to faith in Christ and believe in the God of Israel and the Messiah of Israel, they are sharing the same privileges. Now the Old Testament is also your Bible. Now the God of Israel is also your God. Now the, uh, the ways of God and the Word of God is also your Word of God, okay? So those things belong to you as well. The fig tree is not religious or spiritual, it's the uh, national privileges of Israel. And therefore a Christian cannot be grafted into the fig, he can see the fig. Okay, the Bible says, look at the fig tree. Don't be the fig tree, look at the fig tree. Okay, so we, here we are, Gentile believers, watch Israel coming back to life, watch Jerusalem coming back to be their capital, watch the flag, watch the Hatikva national anthem, watch the Hebrew revive. All of the national aspects of Israel coming back to life, and here we are watching it. So, a believer cannot be grafted into the national, he can be grafted into the spiritual. 
And so that's why the Bible says you've been grafted into the olive tree. You're grafted into the vine, but never you will find that you've been grafted into the fig. To the fig, your relation is that you see. You don't, you're not part of it, you see it. I, as an as a Israeli Jew, but a believer in Christ, I'm both. I am part of the fig tree, but I'm also the one that can see the fig tree and draw a lot of encouragement. We have to understand this perspective. Some people don't like to be grafted. Some people don't like to see. Some people, Some people prefer... need to learn to appreciate what God said about this. Okay, I, I close right. my, my list was wrong, but I have a final question about the second, about the third temple. I have been in Israel, people talk about the calf, about the menorah, about the tools. How you see how it's a First, sign, it's a supreme, it's an ultimate sign? Mm. I, unfortunately, I'm very much uh, frustrated with the dealing with the, the third temple because uh, many times there's a hype, there is a, you know, red calf, red heifer, all of this, all of that. And then those YouTubes get hundreds of thousands from millions of views. And then, and I, you know, and they come and ask me, what do you think? The red heifer is there. I said, no, there's no red heifer. These are young calves and the red heifer is an older cow. It's two different things. And most of the calves eventually grow white or white, one white or two white hairs and they're disqualified. So why would you suggest that the red heifer is here when you know it's not yet at the age when it can be declared red heifer? And lo and behold, no one is talking about them anymore. Um, wild guess they have been already disqualified. It's important that we see that there is an interest among the Jews to build a third temple. But it's also important that we know that the third temple is nothing but a source of deception and confusion for Israel that eventually will be used by the Antichrist to be his place. So I'm saying for the, decept the temple is all about the Antichrist. We need to think about Jesus Christ. And instead of, and, and if we believe that we're not gonna be here for the rise of the Antichrist, we're not gonna be here for the third temple as well. And so why are we always looking at that when we know it's not, it's not for us? Now, am I gonna say that Jews are not into it? Of course they are. It's also part of the signs of the end. But to rejoice in it, to be glad in it, to be happy and, you know, no, I'm not rejoicing and I'm not happy about it. And I will not give it so much room in any of what I do. I mean, uh, I want to close uh, with, uh, with a prayer challenge because, uh, you know, we are facing, you're facing with opposition yeah. because your message is not so uh, nice, even your you mentioned here a few yes. things are not pleased to our audience because we have our own perspective. Mm -hmm. So even our Fomega, when we open our mind and our heart for Israel, we enter in a new battlefield. Mm -hmm. Probably you are facing yes. this day by day. How to pray for you and for... Pray for uh, protection of the mind, the spirit and the body of me and my team and my family also. But also pray that we will have uh, the strength to withstand the opposition and continue and uh, be filled with the Spirit, and that God will provide all of our needs to not give up and continue all the way. Amir is here in Romania for a series of teachings uh, about uh, end time, about uh, revelations. Correct. Uh, tell us in summary, in a minute, yeah. why is your motivation? Why you decided to Again, walk all over the world to talk about this, which is not exactly a very nice subject? Because the book of Revelation is the most butchered, misunderstood, and misquoted by, uh, book of the whole Bible. And uh, anyone that is not reading it and understanding it is being robbed of the blessing. Um, but also God is warning us not to add or re to take away anything. I, I truly believe that much of the fear that is in, installed in the minds and the hearts of so many is due to the lack of understanding of the end. Uh, I think that God gave us this book in order to uh, not only tell us how much he loves us, but also how much he is going to spare us from the most terrible time that will befall this planet. And I also think that, you know, um, this book has to be taught now all over the world because there's a lot of people that take things out of context 
and then get to the wrong conclusion about it. Say a few words about this book. Maybe uh, yeah, that's the book. It's called Revealing Revelation. It's a journey through all the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. As I take it as a tour guide, because formerly tour guide. I, I, it's very easy to understand, very simple, in a simple way, and it will cause you to go and read the book of Revelation and finally get it and, and draw a lot of encouragement from it. So I encourage you to read that book, Revealing Revelation in English, Intelligent Apocalypse. To understand the means. Understanding Apocalypse. Uh, this is you know, a, the revelation. It, it's a must for our church. I believe so. Apocalypse. This is exactly why not only that uh, uh, we, we, we teach, but we also make sure that people will have the book. So we said at the end of this program a short spot that you produce about right. this spot. Thank you, Amir, for Thank the, you very much. being in our studio. And Thank may you. God bless you. And, Remain with this thought in your mind. To understand uh, Revelation, it's a must for this time in order to be ready for the event that will come. May God bless you. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when the first prophecy was, was well, given was it was about Satan's future and it was about the seed of the woman and it's interesting because eventually obviously Mary gave birth to Jesus it was a seed of a woman but it's the nation of Israel that was likened to be the woman that gave birth to the Messiah which we can see also in Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So I believe that as long as Israel exists the world has a problem saying God does not exist. Mm -hmm. The world has a problem saying Jesus does not uh, exist. In fact, the, uh, Jesus was never a Christian. I always tell people Christ could not be a Christ follower. Mm -hmm. He was the Christ. Yeah. And he was born, the Bible says, born under the law mm -hmm. to a woman at the right time, which means he came to the world as a Jew because that was the plan of God to use Israel to provide to the world the word of God, uh, the, the, the belief in one God and the Son of God. And he did that in order, I always tell people that when uh, the enemy acts, he wants to do two things, destroy the evidences and kill the witnesses. Mm -hmm. And the church is known as the witnesses. Go and be my witnesses, uh, Jesus said. But also in the book of Isaiah, God is calling Israel, you are my witnesses. Destroying Israel and destroying Christians is the ultimate goal of the enemy in order to destroy the witnesses yeah. and destroy the evidences. Yeah. And so it will not stop until Satan is gone yeah. forever. So, so how important is Israel on the world stage? Well, obviously Israel uh, is important because you, a it, it is a token of God's faithfulness, mm -hmm. but it's also important because remember Jesus said to Jerusalem, "You will not see me again until you say, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." For Jesus to come back, the Jews must be back in the land. Jerusalem must be back in their hand. Israel must be back a country that they own, and for that, we see it already happening. Yeah. So. Nothing can continue further. No prophetic portion of the scripture can ever be fulfilled before the return of the Jews back to their land. So if we see the progression in Ezekiel 36 of how God is speaking healing to the land before the, prep, you know, the return of the Jews to the land, then he brought them physically. In 37, he saves them from the ashes of the Holocaust. And he's the one who brings them back to their land. In 38, we already see a future war known as yeah. Gog and Magog that we will talk, talk about. about it yes. later. So all of that has to do with the fact that Israel not only must come back to life, but also must getting stronger and stronger and um, have something that the enemy would like yeah. to have. Yeah, but I, I would like to discuss a little bit more about the current situation with the neighboring countries. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, right now, ironically, if you look at Ezekiel 36 through 37, which is the prophecy of the regathering of Israel mm -hmm. to the land, but in 38 and 39, the surrounding countries, in this case, Syria, as it refers to the north in Ezekiel 38 and 39, is going to reference a coalition of forces led by Russia, Russia's in Syria, with the alliance of Iran and Turkey, Libya and Sudan mm -hmm. as well. Those forces have been assembled some years now and are operating and doing weapons transfers and doing all kinds of operations to 
jeopardize the state of Israel. One interesting fact as an American, also a military member, Israel's presence, even though it gets money from NATO, mm -hmm. is a bargain deal when you consider the amount of intelligence, the technology that comes back as opposed to one of the regions taking over that area without that same allied spirit. And so the Bible does prophesy yeah. that these surrounding countries, particularly Iran, Turkey, Russia, Libya, and Sudan, will attempt an invasion for Israel's resources, very similar to what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Yeah. Now you got Jordan and you have Egypt, which on paper are allies and they're doing yeah, business with each other. We have the Abraham Accords, mm -hmm. of course. Yes. Which is um, extremely important, by the way. Yeah. Because biblically, we know that Israel will not be attacked by its neighbors. Mm -hmm. It will be attacked by what we call the second tier mm -hmm. uh, countries. We have to uh, remember that Psalm 83, that uh, has been, I believe, fulfilled in 1948 and 1967, speaks of the immediate neighbors of Israel that invaded into Israel to utterly cut us off from being a nation, that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. The next war is not about our name. It is about what we have, mm. the things they want to take from us, mm. which I believe ultimately, at least for Russia, is the natural gas that Israel found, which is a great substitute for Europe um, uh, instead of the uh, Russian gas. Now, it's very interesting that, um, as you said, the Abraham Accord, it plays a great significant, uh, uh, I think, uh, role, because even in that Ezekiel war, mm -hmm. it says Sheba and Dedan will protest the invasion into Israel. And, and who are Sheba That's and Dedan? That's the Arabian Peninsula of today. That mm -hmm. would be the Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, all that area that we see today. That is the ancient biblical part of Sheba and Dedan. And you can clearly see that we're not talking about war with uh, uh, Saudi Saudi Arabia. We're talking about normalization with Saudi Arabia. We already have peace with the UAE and Bahrain. And so that's a, a, a shift in, in powers that we see. The Arab world or the moderate Sunni Arab world is no longer interested in the destruction of Israel. Yeah. I mean, the, the Shiite Sunni conflict is far greater risk for the Sunnis than Israel's existence. Mm -hmm. They prefer to collaborate with Israel to have the assurances to stand against an Iranian attack. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe Saudi and Iran are normalizing relationship, but Saudi fears Iran. They know that, and Iran hates Saudi, mm -hmm. and it is an ancient conflict that goes almost 1300 years back in history. Mm -hmm. And so Israel is the insurance policy for Saudi Arabia and that area to be able to fight against Iran. So if I understand correctly, the, the war in Ezekiel 38 you refer to very yes. often is going to be a literal war. Absolutely. The Bible speaks of it in a literal sense. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks of how it's going to happen. And the only thing that uh, people must remember is it will not be won in a conventional way. The, the victory in Ezekiel war is a God victory in a supernatural way. And so no one can take any credit for that victory. The armies of Israel, the generals of Israel, the government of Israel are not mentioned mm -hmm. even there as part of the victory. It's the God of Israel that will never allow anyone to destroy his nation. It has to be very clear. The Bible in, in, in the book of Jeremiah 31 says, as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars are there, Israel will be a nation before me. If they will no longer be there, then Israel will no longer be a nation before me. So until we have a new heaven, a new earth, without sun, without moon, without stars, until then, God will protect Israel. So it's going to be an incredible uh, war. And Amazing uh, war. Yeah. It's a war. I'm not sure we'll be here to see it, but if we will, I would be glad to take a front seat where I live, I live mm. next to the Jezreel Valley. I live next to the Armageddon Valley. I see it every day. I would like to sit there and watch God in action, destroying the armies of our enemies right before our very eyes in a supernatural way. Look, I'm not afraid to say supernatural because 
our very existence is supernatural. You cannot explain the rebirth of Israel in a natural way or in a, in a logical way. Our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion said, if you do not believe in miracles, you're not realistic in, in, in mm. our part of the world. This is it. None of our military campaigns could be taught in any military academy. Why? Because it's all based on miracles. Uh, we didn't do anything extraordinary. God protected us in miraculous ways so many times. He blinded the enemy. He gave us wisdom that we, we didn't really have in the top brass uh, of our leader, leadership. So, so I'm saying the minute you take God out of the equation, Israel has no right over the land, no power to stay in the land and no future in the land. That's a special situation. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, Revelation because it's, uh, it's a book that's hard to understand for a lot of people. Do you see a growing hunger for people to understand Revelation? Absolutely. In fact, outside of the church, outside of believers, we have numerous non-believers asking us, what do you think is going on? Is there anything that the Bible has to say about this? And it's an absolute gold mine, we say in English, mm -hmm. for conversation starters. So everyone sees something's happening, but non-Christians are not able to They can't pinpoint it. it. And when you provide that direction with the Bible, it's almost like they feel a sense of peace and security and direction. And it's like they want more of it. It's mm -hmm. like when you feed a child candy, they want more. Although this is not candy, this is more like meat and potatoes and uh, this is stuff that they should have been involved in all the time yeah. reading. But you think about the Bible, the Bible predicted lawlessness on a new level right before the end. Mm -hmm. It predicted turning away from the truth and embracing fantasy mm -hmm. right before the end. It predicted pandemics, earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars. Rumors Everything of wars. Everything we see happening. Yeah. yeah. And, and with a device, I can create a rumor of a, of a war if mm -hmm. I have a huge social media following. Mm -hmm. I can create whatever rumors I want. And fake news has never been as much of an issue as it is mm -hmm. now. And so all of these things are biblically forecast right before the what the Bible calls the very last days. Yeah. I also think that the book of Revelation is the most either ignored book or abused and misunderstood book. Yeah. So there is a, there's a need for clarity without sensationalism. Yeah. The problem is so many people who wants to talk about current situation pull verses out of Revelation, out, out of, of context, context. Yeah. exactly, and make it look like we are already in the tribulation. Yeah. Make it look like all of these. And, and Jesus is specifically warning us for false teachers and deception. So what do you think is the biggest misconceptions people, people believe in when it comes to Revelation? I, I believe that uh, th it's either that Revelation is not to be taken literally, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a bad thing, and or Speak, taking things out of context to believe that we're already into the judgments mm -hmm. of Revelation. Mm -hmm. These are the two big dangers, and both of them are because they take scriptures out of context. And that's the biggest thing today. I think biblical illiteracy. People don't spend time reading the Bible and studying the Bible. They spend time watching YouTube and listening to someone's take on Revelation rather than read Revelation themselves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, half of Revelation is quotes from the Old Testament and half of the book of Daniel speaks of the events of Revelation. You, you cannot separate the two. It's but important if you to know. Yeah, but if, if you only deal with the New Testament and for you the Old Testament is nothing, mm -hmm. you will never understand what Revelation was all about. You see, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, never read the New Testament in his life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like no. all the scriptures he had to be calling scriptures was the Old Testament. I always say Paul never gave one sermon from the New Testament in his life. Mm -hmm. I'm not diminishing the New Testament. I'm just saying don't diminish the Old. Make sure that you, you, you take both, both. Yeah. and remember that this one talks about this one and this one is talking about this one. They cannot be separated. And if you want to understand it well, study them both. Yeah, so it's very important to be able to separate truth from deception. Are we able to train ourselves? Absolutely. And I want to offer two, two very simple steps. Expose yourself to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Read the Bible, listen to the Bible, get a Bible app, sit back on your couch or in bed and listen. It's amazing how much progress you can make just over 
a week of mm. listening to the Bible. But that's not all. Be in an environment with fellow believers so that you can study the Bible together, talk about it, mm. application, challenge, accountability. All of these pieces are very critical for all of the church. Mm. And I say, especially during the end, when we have a rain falling down upon us of lies and yeah. deception, the confusion and the insecurity can be a huge deal for a lot of believers mm. around the world. And these two things, Bible reading and fellowship, can completely wipe out the threat of this yeah. toxic rain. Mm. And I think COVID caused a lot of Christians to feel comfortable doing church at home. Yeah. And then when pandemic is over, they feel way more comfortable yeah. staying at home mm -hmm. and being fed by YouTube rather than by uh, a, a real fellowship. Do not forsake your gathering together. It's a mm -hmm. physical gathering. It's yeah. this koinonia that is very important for the believers. So again, as Mike said, it's, it's the study of the word, but it's also the fellowship of the saints and the accountability that you create and the corporate worship that is so required for the enemy to be out and for the Spirit of God to speak to you. Yeah. yeah, Stephanie, just one thing. Remember the Hebrews passage says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as mm -hmm. is the custom of some. But as you see the day, the approaching. second coming approaching, this is more all the important. more important. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are also a lot of different opinions about the rapture, something you speak about often. We have the pre, yeah. mid, and the post-tribulation views on, uh, on the rapture. Mm -hmm. um, what is your explanation? Well, I, I always believed in the pre-tribulation rapture, but I think the first thing we need to say that most of the church does not even believe in the rapture, mm -hmm. <laughs> not pre, mid, or post. They don't even believe in it. So it's an it's important thing that you know that it's not John Darby that invented it. Mm -hmm. It is the Apostle Paul that spoke about it, and it is something that has precedence also in the Old Testament when it comes to Enoch and Elijah and even when Jesus himself was taken. Now, having said that, uh, the Bible tells us that we're not, uh, you know, we're not destined to the wrath of God. The Bible also tells us that he will take us from the hour of trial and not through the hour of trial. And, and the Bible is also very clear about what is the wrath of God. The wrath of God, according to the book of Daniel, is the entire last week, is the entire seven years of tribulation. And that is not half, it's the whole thing. If we're not destined to the wrath, we're not destined to those seven years. Mm -hmm. If he will take us out of, it's out of those seven years, yeah. not anything else. However, the more important thing, I think, is to stick to the fact that none of us knows the day and the hour. We may know the times and the seasons, mm -hmm. but interestingly enough, the tribulation is one of those portions in history that we know exactly the length of it but in days, weeks, months, and years. We know exactly how long it's going to be. We just don't know when it starts. We don't, yeah, but if we know that it will start when the Antichrist is rising. Yeah. That's what Daniel says. Is, so, is the world stage ready for the Antichrist? Absolutely rise? ready. We see the spirit of the Antichrist already. Mm. We see the mystery of lawlessness already at work. Yes, but remember, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says that that which stops the Antichrist from being revealed is the restrainer. Mm -hmm. The restrainer, the Holy Spirit in us, when the restrainer is being taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be revealed, which means our presence here is what keeps the Antichrist from being mm -hmm. revealed. It, it's not like we're here and we're about to look and find who the Antichrist is. No, we cannot even do that because our very existence yeah. stops him from being revealed. Yeah. Oh,